I'm Jackie Lockie, your financial planning maestro. This series of podcasts is aimed at financial planning professionals and also those who are looking to enter the financial planning profession. We will be talking during the podcast about all things Certified Financial Planner certification related, talking to other CFPs around the world, And also, we will be dropping in on some new entrants who've just entered the financial planning profession, and we'll be checking up along the way on a regular basis with them to see how they're getting on. I hope you enjoy today's podcast. Hello and welcome. I'm Jackie Lockie, your financial planning maestro. And today we are talking all things relating to the Certified Financial Planner Licence and becoming a CFP professional. And I'm joined by a very special guest of mine who's recently passed her CISI Level 7 assessment and become a Certified Financial Planner. And that is Alice Davey, who is Compliance Supervisor at the In Partnership Network. Hello, Alice. How are you doing? Hello. Fine. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks so much for coming on to the show and chatting through your journey along the way to become uh, a certified financial planner. Um, We've got lots of questions to get through um, in our interview today. So I'm going to just start diving in right from the get go. Um, And tell us a little bit about how you got into the financial planning profession. I am one of the many who uh, sort of fell into it accidentally. Um, I just graduated and I was looking for employment and practicing on the interview. So I went along to an interview and um, it uh, was for an independent financial advisors. And I thought it sounded interesting. So what originally was designed as interview practice, I accepted the job and started off um, in admin uh, for for, uh, financial advisors. Well, and then what happened after that? When did you get, you know, how did you get to where you are today? Um, I really uh, liked the technical side of financial planning. And when I first joined, I knew absolutely nothing at all. And they did a really, really good starter course, a sort of introductory course, giving just the the basics of this is a pension, this is an ISA, this is a bond. Um, And after you've done that, they were very encouraging of you going on to take, well, in those days, it was the FPC, FPC one, two, and three. Um, So that's what I did. I um, started on on the exam route. And um, by having those exams, I was able to move uh, from admin through into uh, what was called then the technical unit, um, helping advisors uh, put together um, their advice and reports and uh, reviewing uh, their files for, for suitability of advice. Uh, and that's sort of how I got into uh, the technical and the compliance side. Wow. And does your, your role now, does is that you know, all compliance or is it, because it sounds like that other role was kind of a bit kind of power planning or what we might term power planning now as well as compliance so yeah. do you do you still do both of those bits is it mainly you know the, the kind of file checking compliance aspects it's mainly the file checking compliance aspects now um i'm fortunate where i am that i have the opportunity to, to get involved in uh, sort of all sorts of areas of, of compliance um and so over the years um as well as having done the um sort of dipped my hand in power planning. Um, there's been uh, file reviews, check for suitability of, of advice, um, sort of the field-based monitoring uh, of advisors, uh, complaints as well, uh, especially the technical um, complaints uh, I've been very much involved with as well. Um, but also helping advisors if they've got technical queries themselves, uh, phoning in and and just providing them with a little bit of of support uh, and guidance as well. Mm. Excellent. And so how did you find out about the Certified Financial Planner Licence and why did you decide to undertake this certification? Um, I actually found out about it quite a few years back um, when I was uh, taking my uh, advanced exams, looking to become chartered. Um, I think it was back in the old IFP days, and you could use the certified uh, 
financial planner um, in lieu of having to take uh, the the AF5 financial planning exam. Um, and so I sort of gave it a go, but probably the least said about that, the better. It wasn't really a success. Um, so I ended up doing the AF5 exam in, in, instead uh, and getting chartered and obtaining my fellowship that way. Um, but I always remembered the CFP and I always said to myself, that is something someday I will have to go back and try again. I, I don't like failing at things um, and very much sort of try, try and try again, um, even if it takes a while to get there. So it was one of those promises you make to, make to yourself. Uh, one day I will go back and do that. And that's exactly what you did. It was, yes. Yeah. So fast forward about 12 years and I was talking to one of my colleagues and he mentioned uh, that there was now a route into uh, the, the CFP qualification where if you were already chartered, you could uh, use that, um, that you didn't have to retake the level six exam. You could uh, take two um, sort of online tests to demonstrate your knowledge and then be eligible uh, to apply for the case study. Um, so that's what I did. Um, and that's sort of how I found out about it. it. must be about 18 months ago now. Well, fantastic. And so um, you applied then. So you did your professional assessment. You passed yeah. that nice and swimmingly, um, I know. And then did you go straight on to get the case study or did you have a little pause in between finishing that assessment and then getting the case study? Uh, definitely a little bit of a pause. Um, I was looking at doing the exams in around the sort of March, April time, um, but I didn't get the case study until uh, towards the end of August. Um, having had a little bit of insight uh, previously of what it was going to entail. And also the fact that I was coming very much from a technical side rather than an advice planning advisor side. I wanted to do a lot of preparation. Um, so yes, I was very much on, on the be prepared camp. Excellent. Sounds like a woman after my own <laughs> heart, super organized. So let's talk about the case study itself then. You know, tell me about any specific areas of the case study that you found the most challenging. I think it was the way everything interlinked into everything else. Uh, I think I was quite fortunate in my case study in that it was quite a, a technically bent one. Um, it was one of the newer ones as well, so I don't want to give too much away about it. Um, but yeah, it was that if you pulled one thread, it sort of unraveled about five things at the other end. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> as soon as you thought that, oh, I've got it, I, we can do this. Uh, and then you sort of put it through the, the wonderful spreadsheet um, and it fixed one bit, but then sort of created about three or four different sort of issues to try and work through at the other end. Um, so just trying to piece everything together I think I found the most difficult aspect yeah and it, it's interesting isn't it that 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 those kind of unintended consequences of thinking right you know that's the definitely the first piece of advice I want to give that actually quite often and I think that's quite reflective of real life that because a lot of planners don't give you know all round holistic advice on everything like you did with the case study that actually there are even in real life unintended consequences aren't there Yes, yeah. <laughs> I definitely have to agree with that one. Um, so, yes, that, that trying to keep all the moving parts sort of together. Um, you, you often liken it to a 3D puzzle. Yeah. Um, it felt like the 3D puzzle, but it was on a revolving turntable <laughs> and you were having to put it together while running in the opposite direction. <laughs> Excellent. That's a fantastic analogy, Alice. Thank you for that. Um, I don't know whether that's going to make everybody else run in the opposite direction now or not. But anyway, um, so let's talk about, you know, how did you overcome that, those kinds of issues? I think it was down to having the time to think things through and also the preparation that I'd done beforehand. Um, before going into the case study, I'd um, done a lot of 
to the professional refresher and um, uh, the CPD on yes, the CISI the site. Yeah. Um, they ga- really gave me a good understanding of the sort of CISI thought process into it. Um, I also made sure that on my technical knowledge side, um, that especially where there have been changes in legislation, I was happy I was really up to date. So I didn't have to spend my time worrying about knowledge. Um, I could just concentrate on the case study. Mm. The other thing I think I built in not only time for the actual physical work on the case study, but a lot of just general thinking time over it. Um, I have my own horse and so after work in the evenings I head up to the stables and do my horse chores. Uh, And it's great for thinking things through because your hands are busy, um, but your mind is free to wander. And so whilst I'm doing those chores, I I had a lot of time just to let the ideas percolate, uh, think things through um, and not have any sort of pressurised thought, but just let ideas flow. Um, I've always had a pen and pencil on me and uh, my poor horse got quite used to suddenly me stopping in the middle of doing something going, oh, I must just make a note of that. Um, I think she's probably the most well-versed horse on pensions (laughs) (laughs) that you could find. (laughs) Excellent. And did you find that, you know, when you started, because obviously we did the course together, didn't we? Did you find that you started the course straight away. So you do your preparation and you started the course or did you delay starting the course at all and then kind of feel time pressures, you know, were kind of mounting up against you? Oh no, I started straight away. As as soon as it came live, even in the slight pre-case study, I think it normally opens up about a week beforehand. Yes. Um, I, I was there poised uh, ready to go. Ready for the go button. <laughs> yes. Um, so I was straight away there doing a lot of the preparation, um, especially with things around, uh, for example, assumptions. There was a lot I could sort of do beforehand with those. Um, certainly reading the uh, assumptions paper, which you're given the link through to. Um, and I also had uh, a listen on one of your previous podcasts, uh, which was all about assumptions. Um, so, yeah. Yes, just trying to do as much prep work as, as possible, really, be- before the case study arrived. Yes, I think it's it's quite a task, isn't it, overall? I think, you know, looking back, would you agree with that? Oh, yes. <laughs> and the time goes so quickly as well. Mm. I mean, it's 10 weeks, it, it sounds a long time, but but when you're actually there and doing it, um, I was a little bit time pressured towards the end. Um, so writing it up um fortunately didn't take too long um but I think everyone sort of feels like a little bit of pressure towards the end but fortunately it wasn't too bad um because I'd pretty much managed to keep track uh, and certainly the course um helped me do that um because it would show me if I was getting a little bit behind uh, and knowing I had a one-to-one session booked in meant that I knew I had to have done a certain amount or get to a certain point um before having that call so uh, that definitely helped as well yeah, great, great. And so how looking back now, how long do you think that the whole process took you to pass that assessment? Oh, um I think on the case study itself, it was probably easily up to about 200 hours. Um with the preparation work beforehand, ooh, easily another 50 plus. Um mm. But I am one of those people who do like to sort of really prep. Um, So, yeah, I might have taken that perhaps uh, to its nth degree. Um, But, yeah, no, it it is a real time commitment. And I think that's something else you, you have to make sure you've prepared for as well. Yes, yes. It's not, you're not just bowling up and, you know, a week out from the assessment deadline that you kind of go, right, well, better open open my case study now and crack yeah. on with it. <laughs> no, that, that wouldn't work. Um, I also, because I knew that um, my ability to work on the case study during the week was quite limited with working full time and, and then at the stables, I sort of built my time in around that. Yeah. Um, I arranged for a horse sitter for Sunday afternoons for the 10-week period. Oh. Um, and um, 
I uh, also use some of my annual leave as well um, to make sure that I would have enough time to do it. Um, again, listening to the podcast, I had a fair idea of the amount of time I'd need to commit to it. So it meant that I was able to sort of arrange things and put plans in place to make sure I could carve out that sort of time limit for yes. it. And that's a fantastic achievement um, and testament to your, all of your hard work and dedication, Alice, even to take annual leave as well to make sure that you could complete this case study assessment. So very well done for doing that. And you passed, didn't you? I did. Yes. Um not first time, uh, but I was expecting that. Um, I was aware that um, it's more likely that you might have to have a, a sort of second bite. And especially as this was very different to what I normally do as well. Um, so from that point of view, it's going, it was going to be a challenge anyway. Um, so, yeah, I just think I tried to do as much as I possibly could for the first admission uh, and then see how I got on. Um, I got into a real panic because after I typed up all my report, um, everyone was sort of busy saying, oh, you know, trying to keep it down to the 60 page limit and, and um, you know, I've, I'm over by this amount of pages. And I finished mine and it was at about 47 pages. I was about 13 pages under the limit. And um, I was a bit worried I, I may have taken the sort of don't waffle, um, <laughs> perhaps a little <laughs> bit too literal. Um, but I think it, it was perhaps, again, the nature of the case study I happened to have. Mm. And so it was it was with great trepidation um, that I, I pressed the send button and, uh, and sent it in. But uh, you were very close to passing, though, weren't you, on your first I was, admission? You were yes. within a gnat's whisker away. I was. I was really pleased with the result. Um, it was 6% off the overall pass mark, and I passed three of the six units. Um, on the other three, you had where you have to have uh, over 50%, on all the three I didn't pass, I had 50%. Wow. Um, <laughs> so, no, I was really, really pleased with that. And the feedback given was, I found, really useful as well. It really helped me focus on what I, I needed to do next. And did you find that that feedback was telling you, you know, what where you went wrong rather than what you needed to do to fix it? Would you say that that's a fair assessment? Yes, yes, I think that is fair. And uh, what I liked about it was that it was overall feedback. So even the sections which I'd passed and done quite well in, it still gave the comprehensive feedback. And in fact, um, a lot of the rework I did was actually on some of the units I'd already passed because they had a knock-on effect into the units that I hadn't passed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, excellent. And so what, what were the sorts of things that you did on the areas that you had passed on? Um, it was expanding on a, a couple of points, clarifying. Um, it's also where I think sometimes it, it is quite complex and you do get a bit tangled. Um, I'd got so um, focused on the cash flow planning and how the numbers were running down. Um, I completely forgot about the cash reserve. Oh. <laughs> and so it's <laughs> and when they said, we can't see where you've kept your client's cash reserve, I was like, oh dear, yes. Um, <laughs> I need to go and fix that. Um, and uh, I think in the inheritance section, it was perhaps explaining uh, as much why we were doing something uh, equally why we we weren't doing other things. Um, fortunately, of course, having those 13 pages free, I had plenty of room um, yes. to, to sort of add things in. Um, and it was a few other sort of minor little little tweaks around that, uh, that sort of thing as well. Excellent. Um, excellent. Plenty of wiggle room to play with then. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so do you think that looking back now after going through that process, do you think that it it is going to help you in your job moving forward or do you think it has helped you in your job moving forward to date? Uh, definitely. It's already uh, been a huge help, uh, especially around the um, cash flow modelling. 
Um, I think a lot of uh, advisor firms are, are looking to really incorporate that into their financial planning mm. um, and certainly seems to be becoming more and more popular. So yeah, I've already been using uh, a lot of the skills I learned uh, within work pretty much from, from the first day dot really. Uh, so no, it's it's been hugely useful. Yes. And uh, so your favourite subject is not only cash flow planning, but assumptions now, Alice? Um, yes, I <laughs> did get very much into my assumptions. I think I probably had about six or seven pages uh, in the appendix on assumptions. Uh, basically, if it moved, <laughs> it got jotted <laughs> down to have an assumption. Um, I'd be having a conversation with someone about something completely different and I completely break off going, oh, I must put that down as an assumption and out came the little pen and, and pad. I, I think I was very fortunate with my work colleagues and my family that they just sort of grinned and, and nodded at me and and, and sort of let, let me carry on really and, and just sort of had a, a, a bit of a gentle smile at me as I was completely obsessed with this case study. Yes, completely yeah. immersed into the whole thing. Completely, yes. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. And so, you know, I guess, you know, how how has the reaction been at work with your colleagues since since passing? Everyone's been really, really positive, and I think everyone's been very appreciative uh, that it's it's not easy, but it's definitely worthwhile. And so, no, they they've been really support- well. They were very supportive when I was going through the process, and so no, they've been really pleased for me, and that's always nice as well. Yeah, fantastic. That's great to hear because I think sometimes you know there are employers out there who 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 kind of play lip service to you know well you do it if you want to, but actually don't give you that support and don't give you the recognition when you get out the other side of it. Um, so uh, that's really great to hear that you know the CFP is recognised by them and also that you've been well supported along the way. So. We're nearly at the end of our interview, although, Alice, I could keep firing questions at you all day, but I promised that I wouldn't. So tell me, give me a little bit of advice to those people who are listening, who are thinking about starting their journey to become a CFP professional today. Maybe they're sitting on the fence a bit. Can you share any tips that might encourage them or help them along the way? I can, yes. I think the first one is um, that, you can do it. It is possible. Uh, even if, like me, you started out at the very beginning of your career with no knowledge at all, you, you can get there. Um, I definitely recommend uh, a lot of research and preparation. Uh, do as much preparation up front as you possibly can. Um, that 10 weeks goes so quick you can't be learning about um, technical aspects while you're trying to do the case study. That's knowledge you should already have at the tip of uh, tip of your fingers. Um, so yes, preparation is definitely key. Um, help and support, I think, is going to be number two. Um, I certainly looked for a course to support me, and that's how I, I came across you, Jackie, and mm-hmm. joined uh, for, for your course. And also on the support and help. Um, friends and family. Um, Work colleagues were where I was doing this, uh, as were my work. Uh, My friends and family were where I was doing this. So I sort of said to them, you know, this is a big thing I'm doing. And so where it was the case of I can't really meet up because I've got to study that day um, or being very sort of focused on the case study and perhaps not quite quite as involved uh, in other things as I normally would be, that they were really behind me and they knew why I was taking that track um, and were very sort of encouraging that I go through this process. Um, So, yes, and I think that means as well when you're spending the time on the case study, if you've already got that time pre-carved out and pre-agreed, it will make life a a lot easier. Mm. So... We are now at the end of our interview. Alice, thank you so much for sharing your journey with uh, both me and all of our listeners. Um, And I think particularly important to share your journey with, you know, young females who are coming into the profession. And as we were just saying offline earlier, weren't we, that, you know, we want to do whatever we can to encourage, you know, lots of new blood into the profession because it's a great place to be and a great place to work, isn't it? 
It is, yes. Uh, the thing I've always really enjoyed about working in this industry is when I was first starting out, um, there was always a colleague who was willing to help me. If I went to them asking a question or if I showed an interest in something, they were always willing to spend the time with me to go through and explain and help me. Um, and that's why I feel very strongly that if I have colleagues come to me or especially um, people who are sort of first starting their, their journey and taking their exams, I'm quite happy to spend my free time helping them out as, as I can as because that's what I had the opportunity um, when, I, when I was younger. And uh, I think if everyone in the industry does that, then yes, it does make it a really, really good place to work. Yeah. And on that note, we will leave it there. Alice, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you ever so much for having me. It's really interesting, isn't it, to listen to different people who have different experiences of gaining their Certified Financial Planner certification or maybe developing the financial planning profession at large. If you know anybody who you think might be interested in listening to any of these podcasts, then please do pass on our details. That's it for me. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. See you again soon. Bye for now.